Welcome, everybody, to Imaginative Guest Interview. This is our first guest interview, and Trip Clemens is the first victim of the <laughs> Imaginative team. We're very, very lucky to have Trip talk to us today. Trip, I'm going to give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about yourself. Before you do that, I just want to say that I met Trip about 10 years ago. He was still a student back then. He was coming up with this crazy idea to build a film company which he then went on to do with a bunch of partners, create, created Windy Films, and has been making commercials and documentaries for a decade now. Some other events are going on in his life right now, which we are not allowed to talk about, but soon we will, and that's super <laughs> exciting. Uh, but welcome, Trip. Really excited to have you as, as our first guest. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Chris. I actually didn't realize I was your first guest. I should have brought a bottle of champagne at yeah. 11 yeah. a.m. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, well, yeah. the, the reason why you're joining us today, and I'm going to let you talk a little bit about this, is one of the biggest things that has, or the industries that's been impacted by AI is video, right? Video, the creation of video, filmmaking, commercial making, all of this stuff is in the targets, crosshairs of AI. And as somebody who is in this space, who makes commercials, for a living, we brought you in today so that you can help us understand what that impact looks like right now, what we can foresee, what are the technologies, what are the applications. So yeah, why don't we start there with just maybe who you are and what are you doing in your day-to-day -day life? Sure. What that means from the point of AI. Uh, yeah, uh, happy to provide a little background on me first, just to answer the first yeah. part of your question. So as you mentioned, started a production company uh, 10 years ago, based in Boston, we've now grown and moved to New York. I'm the last um, of the Boston holdouts. I've got one other partner and we've, um, we're holding it down in our founding city. But the team and all the infrastructure now in New York, um, along with most of our clients. Um, so Windy Films is purpose-built to tell stories of social impact. And we do that for documentaries. That's our origin. We made a feature-length documentary a decade ago that aired on PBS and kickstarted our career. And we thought, you know, maybe we could do this for a living. And as as all um, <laughs> as all early career decisions are, it's kind of a mix of naivete and bravery and um, optimism yeah optimism yep but it, it worked yeah. out we signed the lease on 100 year old fire station um, that's been our studio for the last decade we actually just moved out of it because we are building a bigger space in new hampshire um <laughs> but it's been a it's been a fantastic run um you know we serve everyone from small <laughs> local nonprofits to fortune <laughs> 50s um and we don't focus on what you sell. We focus on what you share in terms of your values and not as much your product. So that's really what we do. We tell stories about people, often real people, sometimes mm -hmm. casting, but often it's a true story about someone who um, is making an impact in, in the world in a positive way. So a lot of focus on um, environmental justice, um, racial justice, um, reproductive mm -hmm. rights. And obviously I'm straight white guy my founding partners also straight white guys we we said our role here is actually not to be the storytellers after a few years we said um, our role is to build the company and build the infrastructure to support storytellers who are closest to those stories in terms of their own lived experience so that's right. been our business model it's how we scaled the company um, and completely separate from our discussions around AI and filmmaking it's been a I think it's been an interesting journey in DEI before we even had those initials for it because we saw DEI as a central part of our business model, not a kind of marketing um, experiment that I think a lot of people mistake it for. It, it just made business sense for us to widen the tent and include more um, diverse perspectives. So anyway, yeah. that's the background on Windy. Um, and, and we're now yeah. obviously at a very pivotal point with artificial intelligence and mm -hmm. feels like a whole new chapter. Um, yeah. Tell yeah. us a little bit about that. You've got um, something you showed me the other day. You've got AI already working for you. So tell us how it's affecting your day-to-day -day work specifically. 
But then I also want to hear a little bit about that documentary journalistic influence. We, you and I spoke about this the other day. There's a big potential disruption to that world. And then, of course, entertainment. You know, there's uh, a lot of production going on in the world of streaming. So we need to understand how AI is going to change, improve, make it worse. Who knows what? Yeah. I mean, the, the moving image as it's bought and sold and, and made and consumed is largely in one of three categories, entertainment, journalism, and advertising. And those are blurring. The, the Venn diagram is becoming just more of a circle. But um, well, give, us, give us an example because we've obviously seen product placement. We've sure. Seen, uh, sure. Ad- advertorial has made um, probably the biggest change to the way that companies market is that they are, they, you know, they've got a content team, they've got content creators. This is very much advertorial, you know, baked in as educational or um, training. How is it a change? How is it changing from a production point of view? How yeah. is AI? How is AI changing that, or how are the lines well, between those three trends, zones? But, yeah, regardless of AI, like what are we seeing in yeah, right now yeah. in two thousand twenty-four? What that actually means? What advertorial? What yeah? What placement? Are those terms even relevant anymore? Are they changing? I mean, when I hear product placement, I think very much of, um, <laughs> you know, like. It's like very goofy Austin Powers movies where he would like hold up the Coke can. Yeah, like that to me is what product placement means. And it's almost like a dated term because it's so much less obvious than that now. Yeah, yeah. And and, and I just think that like when you have audiences developing both extreme allergies to advertising mm-hmm. and extreme desires for storytelling – Mm-hmm. That just creates a whole new set of opportunities for advertisers and for brands mm-hmm. because we are simultaneously downloading ad blockers and signing up for Netflix in like right. record, nu- record numbers, right? So what yeah. does that mean? That means that we have an aversion to being sold things, but we strongly desire to connect with other people, connecting with other people and their stories and their experiences just – it's just a, a definition of storytelling. So we want that desperately. We're feeling lonely. We're feeling isolated, especially since the pandemic. Screens are just becoming a, a majority of our waking life. A mm-hmm. majority of our waking experience is to just to have at least one screen in front of us. And that is further isolating us. But at the same time, it's tricking us because it's presenting us with a solution for connecting with others mm. in, in, a, in a strange, cheap, quick way, which is to consume the stories um, mm. of largely entertainment and also journalism, but also advertising. If advertising can do it well. So we talked about this briefly yesterday, Richard. It's like, I will go look for a solution for a product that I need, like a cleaning solution. And I will look it up on YouTube, you know, highest reviewed, uh, you know, refrigerator cleaning solution or whatever it might be, or I need to clean my stove. And the algorithm knows I'm looking for that. So they'll serve me an ad and I will hover over the skip button. (laughs) Just As soon as I can hit skip. And then whatever plays after that could be effectively the same kind of ad like object it could be the same kind of product served to me but but the only difference is that i chose it right i was actively seeking it out and it wasn't forced on me and the other major difference is that it at least feels in its presentation more like an organic story because it's the story of this youtube guy who or or gal who is like yep this was the problem i had i'm on my journey this is my character arc i needed to find a solution I solved my problem. That's just the classic three act structure, really? you know, where, where we have this protagonist who's trying to clean their, clean their house. They find the solution and they get that done. Like, okay, I can relate to this. I can see myself in their position. I can, I can identify yeah. with that story. So something you said the other day that really kind of s- stayed with me was how do you create content that people don't skip over, but rather skip to? Yeah. Right. And it's a, it's a really hard thing for some of our clients, all clients, all brands really wrap their head around because their natural inclination is to 
point the camera at the product and hit record <laughs> or take the picture. That's they're like, that's what we've got to do. And at the same time, if you phrase it to them that way, you're not putting them in the position of their current job, which is to sell the product, but you're putting them in the position that they are for beyond their nine to five, which is just to be a normal, normal human who's consuming things. And then they say, oh yeah, wait a second. As a non-marketer, just as a human being, I would rather not make the content that I want to skip, but I want to make the content that I want to skip too. And there are brands who do this really well. Yeti, Patagonia, um, Nike recently, in some ways, have been doing incredible work around just storytelling. And you can't even find the product anywhere in the film. I mean, what I feel like I'm watching is a short film. Um, and it's irrelevant that the product is in there. There's just, at some point in the experience, if it's in the captions or if it's in the end, they've got their logo or somewhere in the description below on YouTube, it's like, oh, they were involved. That's going to stick with me much more than if you tried to force feed me, you know, Yeti's cooler, for example. True. I'm, I'm going to jump in and because I have so many questions. One is your, your background is fascinating. It's, it's great to just soak in all of your perspective in the industry. Let me ask you about AI. Can you think back to when you first saw the new generative AI video models and a product from them? What was your initial reaction? Do you remember? I mean, I, I remember mid-journey, obviously. Um, I think that was most people's you know, initial experience with it. But obviously, like the one that we look back on and laugh at now is Will Smith eating spaghetti, right? Because <laughs> it is so bad in retrospect, and yet at the time it was so scary. Yeah. And it's incredible how that perspective of the same object has changed over time. Right. Impressive. Yeah. You know, and I look at a lot of early mid journey imagery and I think that is so obviously AI. Whereas at the time I thought you fooled me. And so not only is AI evolving, but humans are also evolving and our ability to recognize AI is evolving. It's almost like when the first movie theater audience saw the train coming at them <laughs> on the projector. They jumped out of their seats because they thought they were going to actually get hit by a train. And now we are just constantly stimulated with things that are way more, quote unquote, like visually traumatizing than a train. And it's, it's not fooling us anymore. It's not even fooling our children who we like, you know, put iPads in front of all day. So I think that humans biologically are going to struggle to keep up with AI, but at the same time, maybe not our, our physical bodies, maybe we need to actually adapt that technology and wearables and all of these you know, chips that we're surrounding ourselves with, they will do the work of evolving our bodies, but maybe our brains are actually evolving faster than we give them credit for. Maybe, maybe our brains are actually able to recognize, um, uh, even if we don't have the vocabulary for it, even if we can't describe it, if we can't say why, we can't say why we think this is um, good. <laughs> we can't say why we think this is bad. We can at least smell it. And I think that's starting to happen as the technology for AI evolves. We will also evolve with it too and, and recognize, um, you know, whether or not it's still working, quote unquote. Okay. All right. So I, I love your optimism. I, I love the fact that you're looking at AI as an opportunity. Do you see AI and uh, generative AI specifically as a threat to the creative industry? Where on the scale do you fall? Yeah, I'm cautiously optimistic. Hmm. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not of the doomsday um, camp who thinks this is going to displace all of us within a year. I'm also not of the ultra optimists, the kind of techno optimist who thinks this is going to solve all of humanity's problems, solve climate change, solve hunger, et cetera. I, I think it's still just a reflection of us, like all of the tools that we have, it's still just a reflection of how we use them. And so mm -hmm. it's an expression of who we are. It's an expression of our priorities. It's an expression of our values. And therefore, it, you know, Unless it, unless the, the 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 horses really run out of the stable and we can't control AGI and it <laughs> suddenly P doom is tomorrow, right? I mean, like I just I don't see that happening anytime soon. But um, 
and until then, I, I very much so feel like it's in our control. And you're mm-hmm. already starting to see that. You're starting to see regulation. You're starting to see ethical pushback, lawsuits moving through the courts, Getty Images suing mid-journey saying, hey, isn't your product just recycling our product? Um, and so... The answer to that is yes. Yeah, of course it is. Yeah. And yeah, perplexity, of course, is just recycling the New York Times and and, and the Wall Street Journal. And so, you know, however in archaic and old the courts may be, they're surprisingly built for this. I mean, it's pretty impressive to have this kind of judicial system that is centuries old, modeled after a system that is millennia old <laughs> and it somehow applies. It somehow works. It somehow keeps it in check. Um, right. And so I, that's, that's why I'm t- kind, of, kind of cautiously optimistic, because I still think that these tools are going to just be a reflection of us. They're not going to get away from us or take control of us. I think that they're going to serve us if we know how to use them. I think if you don't know how to use them on a very like technical job description level, you're in, you're in, you're in a little bit of trouble. Mm. I think that if you aren't integrating them into your workflow, then it's worth be, it's worth taking well, the time to do that. Can you be specific about that? Let's say I'm a producer. I've been producing commercials for a while. I've got a small studio, and I choose to ignore AI. What does my track look like versus the track that you are advocating? Which I've seen even some of your work where you. you use some tools to collapse the timeline or collapse the production to a different thing. Like, what does that actually look like from a day-to-day point of view? Well, I can answer you specifically, but I can, <laughs> then I can show how that data yeah, points. Yeah, anecdotes are great because you know, I don't think we're in a, in a universe where this is widely distributed anyway. I think that's why we invited you here is you are one of those people who have, albeit cautiously, put your toe in the water, tried out the tools, used it in a actual client interaction recently, all the benefits of that. Maybe that prompted you to think about what you might do next time or how you might educate other people within your sphere. Yep. That's the, the, spe- the specificity or the, the anecdotalness of it is. Yeah. Yeah, happy to. So AI is not our product yet, but it is certainly improving our process. And by that, I mean the commercials that we make, a 30-second broadcast commercial that you're going to see starting uh, in a month from now. Um, It's going to air locally in New England all summer long. Um, We shot it at Fenway Park on Tuesday. It was super fun. We had the crew. We had the gear. We had good vibes. It's effectively the same process that's been in place for making a commercial for like the last 100 years. Um, you know, person walks in, sets up a camera. Person walks in, sets up a light. Other person walks in, stands in front of the camera, says a line. Like that hasn't changed. Amazingly, even with digital, digital didn't change that physical process. It changed the post process for for certain. You're not, you know, scanning stuff in the labs anymore. But it it's it's still the same physical act of labor, mostly standing <laughs> to to manufacture the product and. We aren't seeing a market demand or or a value proposition from AI to change that aspect of it just yet. We are certainly seeing the tools to improve everything that happens before that day of production. So take this again, this commercial we just shot at Fenway Park. Traditionally, we would have a storyboard artist illustrate out each of the shots that we want to get. And they might do that by hand, or they might use some AI to do that now. Some of the storyboard artists that we hire are integrating AI into their workflow so they can work quickly and add that kind of quality to it. And, and how would that might look like? Like somebody's actually prompting mid-journey to create a series of images that they are going to use as the storyboard. So it's yeah. what's the benefit that they're, they're striking a balance between speed and resolution? Yeah. Um, in fact, even the step before that, we will physically go to Fenway Park and take photos with our iPhone of generally the shots that we want to get. We will then mm-hmm. send those to a storyboard artist who will use that image as well as their text 
as a prompt to create a new image. And then they might bring that into Photoshop, add a layer to sketch on top of that. And so it's really a blend of manual labor and AI kind of automation. And we thought that that is really helpful. However, it's not quickly iterative. And by that, I mean, if we want to change one of the shots, it's an email or a phone call to the storyboard artist, a couple hours at least, for them to mm. reposition the camera angle of that single shot, send it back to us, approval process, et cetera. Even if that person was in-house on our team, that's still some manual labor. And it's just not iterative to the level that we want. We want to be able to quickly see variations in this prototyping of our product. And so we've recently gotten into Unreal Engine, which is this kind of 3D world. The, the name Unreal says it all. <laughs> um, but we've downloaded a model of Fenway Park. We found one available online for $300. There were surprisingly many models of, of Fenway Park, but one of them we found... So just so that people understand, if they've not seen or heard of Unreal, essentially it's both an application and a marketplace. Mm -hmm. So in the same way that if you're an engineer and you're trying to figure out which pieces of an engine need to be fabricated for that engine to work, you would first go into AutoCAD and design that engine. You would buy from the marketplace the screw, this device, whatever, as your different pieces of that 3D puzzle you would then accumulate that into a model that you can then say to the other engineers, go and lay this thing or make this thing. You're doing a similar kind of thing. You're saying, this is the space, but I'm going to bring elements of the future or of this space that we're creating from the marketplace. People have been literally making a Fenway Park somewhere in a 3D model that you then import into your space. Yeah. The context on Unreal is that it's a software made to design video games. And video games, you know, when I was growing up, like Super mm -hmm. Mario was not like a believable environment. It wasn't realistic. So they made it surreal mm -hmm. and that was fun. Mm -hmm. But the technology has advanced so much mm -hmm. that people look at this tool, Unreal Engine, and they realize I don't I can I can sure I can make a very realistic looking world for a video game, but I can do that for real estate, I can do that for entertainment, I can do that for advertising. Mm -hmm. Anything that I want to imagine, mm -hmm. I can do in this software. So suddenly this software, which is still like culturally very much so in the video gaming world, which is not a world that I occupy, has become this tool of choice for people in advertising and, and people in real estate to imagine a building that doesn't yet exist. So it's, it's become this incredible tool that has suddenly like leaped the fence into all of these other industries. We're using it. Many other people are using it. So again, in the specific context, we go into this marketplace, we download a model of Fenway Park. It is so detailed down to each individual seat, right? Incredible. It even has the most recent... Um, you, Does it also have expensive hot dogs and, and beer? <laughs> It doesn't have hot dogs and beer, but it does. It does have like every individual seat. It has even like the this year's sponsorship signs on the wall. So incredible detail. We then download the model. So that's the first ingredient. The second ingredient is people. There are people in the spots, right? We have a family sitting in this scene. We've got a guy carrying a tray of nachos and beer in another scene. We've got another family who's looking at their phone, which is ultimately this spot was for a software company. So in the final scene, we see the software on the phone in one shot. And okay, so ingredient number two, characters, we need to bring those in. They have these things called metahumans that are kind of realistic, kind of not, but close. You can see that the curve on that is, is, is pretty exponential in terms of accuracy of modeling. Okay, but they're just static humans. You download them, you put them into Fenway Park, and they look very odd because they're just like standing with their arms wide, staring into outer space. You're like, okay, how do I get you to sit down in these seats? How do I get you to clap, right? And there's the next ingredient, which is motion and animation, right? That animation is the third ingredient. And either you know how to, quote, rig the characters in Unreal Engine with typing and clicking, 
because you click their elbow, you tell it to swing, you either click their knee, you tell it to swing. That's traditionally rigging with animators as it has been for a long time. Okay, but recently you can stand in a room that's got cameras everywhere, wear, a, wear like a green suit that has like golf balls taped to every joint and the cameras will recognize in 3D space the motion that you're doing with your body so you can apply that to the characters. Recently, recently, like in the last like year or few months, you don't even need the room. You don't need all the golf balls on your joints. You just need one app. The app we used was called Move One. And it's incredible. You set it on like a, a windowsill or a bookshelf. You hit record and you move. Just you move your body in the way that you want to apply that to the character. And I don't know how it does it, but with some little AI magic, it can recognize in 3D space how you're moving your body, even though it's only filming you from one perspective on your phone. And in minutes, it creates that animation, you drag that into Unreal, apply it to the metahuman character. The metahuman character, you can then say, okay, I want a different shirt color, I want them to be wearing a hoodie, or I'm gonna actually put their hair in a ponytail, I need them to be 10 pounds heavier, that's the kind of casting that you can do to those metahumans. Because we want, again, the whole goal here is to make this as specific as possible to what we're going to shoot. The best prototype is the product. So if we can make the product in advance as close as we can, that's the successful prototype. And so we've got our model, Fenway Park. We've got our characters, which are these metahumans. We've got our animations that we recorded from our phone with the move one app and then the last ingredient are the props remember i said there was this guy carrying a tray of nachos and beer and then somebody else is looking at their phone these aren't like these don't come with the metahumans and they might not be in the marketplace chris or excuse me richard that you described of okay so you can go download a car or you can download a house or you can download a tree these are models that people have put in unreal but nobody has made a nacho tray for, for us but i also don't know how to model that you can now use ai and this is really the ai integration here because what i've described so far is mostly 3d modeling pre ai Use AI for that Move One app to record your animation with your iPhone. And then really we leverage AI for text to 3D model prompting. So you can go to tools like Luma, um, Luma Labs has Genie now. Um, and there's a few others where you just type in nacho tray with beer or food tray with nachos and hot dogs and beer. And in like 60 seconds, it gives it back to you. And how long would have that, you would have had to actually go and get the food oh. prep. You would have had to shoot that maybe in a studio. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Talking about days, weeks, months of work. You know, actually, that actually is a good idea, Richard, because I can go get, I can go walk down the street in downtown crossing. I can go buy a tray of food, nachos, beer, and I can take photos. I can take about 50 photos of that with my iPhone from every different angle and using a new technique called Gaussian splatting. It's a very weird, very weird phrase, but using Gaussian splatting, I can create a very photorealistic 3D model of any object using just a bunch of photos from my phone. So that is, that is a great alternative. Yeah. But it's amazing how a year ago, Gaussian splatting was absolutely <laughs> state of the art. Brand new technology, blowing everybody's mind. I mean, it's not just small objects. I could go Gaussian splat an entire city. If <laughs> I fly a drone around the whole city, I can take a bunch of photos of it from different angles and Gaussian splat a 3D model of it. That's incredible, yeah. Even one better, I can now do that with Google Earth. Google Earth has 3D models of, of mountains, cities. So I can go just screen record myself flying around a city in 3D space on Google Earth, drag that into Gaussian splat it, and I have a 3D model of that city now. So what we're seeing broadly is really a transition from physical labor to digital labor. It's still manual. There's still some element of manual labor, but it's just more people are sitting and fewer people are standing. Mm -hmm. And so 
you know, instead yeah. of me standing and launching the drone and flying around to see the city, I can just capture that on Google Earth and create the 3D model. Trip, I first thanks for diving that deep into the process. I think that's super helpful. I'm going to ask you some follow-up questions. So, so to be clear, you're using these AI tools for mostly pre-production. Is any of the final product going to be using an output from like a Gaussian splat or from Move One Capture? Or are you still going on set and filming the final product in that likeness? So we're already seeing folks who are on the leading edge of this using into using AI integrated into the final product. It is not the whole product, but if you guys look up uh, Paul Trillo, for example, he's a talented director. He's been around for a while. Um, he's really showing the world how you can integrate elements of 3D, elements of Unreal into live action. And he's doing it in a way that um, hides the trick, which I think is the goal. You don't yeah. want to show you. You don't want to show your hand, right? A magician kind of never reveals the secret, and so if never. the secret is that you're using AI, you don't want to reveal that. Sometimes the creative actually is leaning in on the weirdness of AI. For example, like yeah. I think it was Gatorade that just did this commercial about how they don't have any artificial flavors, and so they leverage the word artificial flavors against the word artificial intelligence to have the opening of the spot being a bunch of really weird dysmorphic football players that are just like mid journey blobbing into each other and then hard cut, no artificial flavors. We're clearly in now a live action space with a real human drinking a real beverage. So there's some creative uses of the imperfections, which I think are kind of cool. But when you're, when you're trying to create something that is realistic even if it is surreal, it still is like believable. Um, Paul Trillo is definitely on the kind of leading edge of showing that integration. It's not as though I can type in my creative for my commercial and AI will give that to me in a realistic way. That, that's not here yet. So yeah. I still have to leverage some amount of live action, real production, um, and then integrate a, a couple tools along the way. But yes, to answer your question, we're just using it to prototype so far. Okay. Um, yeah. So for that Fenway thing, it's like once we had the models and once we had the characters in, we had them animated. We then moved the cameras around, and we recorded from different angles. And then we added sound effects, we added voiceover, we added music, and we had our thirty-second commercial before we shot it. We sent it to the crew, we sent it to the client. We said, "This is what we're about to make for you," or "This is what you're about to make with us." In the case of the crew. And everybody was clear. It was like, we're all on the same page. <clears throat> we know the timing of our shots. We know the camera motion that we're going for. Oh, we understand that there's this many seats we can see in the background from this angle, but we only have cast for 10, 15 extras. We need to raise the camera up slightly so we see fewer seats in the background. That's the kind of testing that, that we're doing. Um, and that's just a level of accuracy that we're not able to get with traditional storyboarding. And so that's yeah. that's really the purpose of 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 how we're using AI in in our pre production. The, the two things that come up for me are the one is the time to production, right? So you're collapsing time, you're able to do that. The second thing is you're also taking advantage of a a world in which the context of the content is very important. So I don't have to wait several months to come up with this concept, do a whole bunch of pre-production, production and post-production in order to get it out. You were telling me that to do the move one work, to do the real engine, the unreal engine work, those were just like, we're talking hours of effort versus days or months. So if something's happening in the news, I can immediately jump on that. If I'm the creative director, I can say, this is topical, it meets your brand promise or identity. We'd like to make something for you, and we're days away from doing that versus months or weeks or even years. Yeah. Yeah, and we're using it not just to see the thing before we make it, but we're using it to see the thing before we sell it. In a traditional advertising pitch, you know, think of Mad Men, right? It's like, and on this poster board, we have concept one. No, you don't like that? Okay, we have another concept right behind it. And what Don Draper was showing was the result of like hours or days of the illustrator 
who was working a few floors below him in the same building, right? Putting those concepts together, illustrating them out by hand. And the output was just like, here's one frame. Here's one thing. It's going to demonstrate the concept. Use your imagination largely for the rest of it. And the the effect that we're able to have now with kind of rapid prototyping from a sales perspective is that we can demonstrate all of those different concepts more explicitly. The, The issue that we're running into is that unless it's a full demonstration of the quality of our product, it's not worth doing. Mm. Oh, okay, so we're still dealing with an uncanny valley issue where yes, you've got those metacumans who just look like blobs. Yeah, and you put them into a fake Fenway environment. Yeah, your client's reaction might be, "Gee, that's not the quality we're looking for. You're definitely not on brand here." Yeah, and that's okay after we've <laughs> sold the job. <laughs> it's kind of like you want to be on your best behavior when you're dating, but then once you get engaged, you're like, okay, I can let a few things slip and like we can be we can be more real with each other. It's yeah. almost like that where we've sold the job and it's like, okay, this prototype isn't going to be pretty, but it is going to be precise. Mm-hmm. And that's more important than it so being clarity. than yeah. it being pretty. After you've sold the job, you're prototyping the product, precision and clarity is paramount and prettiness is not. The opposite is true in the pitch. In the pitch, it's all about prettiness. It's all about razzle-dazzle. It's all about quality. The concept has to also be there. But if it's accurate to the final product, it's like, who cares? It's going to change anyway. They're going to have notes. It will keep changing. It doesn't have to be explicit to the script. It has to just look great and feel great. It's almost like a famous quote from Bill Clinton, right? He's like, governing is, is prose. And campaigning is poetry. I just like you speak in two completely different ways before or after I get your vote. <laughs> well, let, let me add to this because I'm, I'm super fascinated with this note trip. What do you choose to use AI with today a lot as much as what you don't choose? And so you didn't mention that like you're using AI like a chat GPT for writing scripts. You, you didn't mention using AI for generating like sound effects and music. Um, why not? Well, we are for sound and music slightly, okay, but um, still an integration with a human. And so it's still a musician's tool. That might change. I recognize that, that, that the trend of consolidation of skill sets might mean that that's then you know, the director's tool and not the musician's tool. But I don't know, I, I still see the kind of lasting, lasting, timeless power of collaboration. I think even if you've consolidated all of the tools into one person's skill set, there's still too many single points of failure for that one person to be carrying all aspects of the entire production alone. So, so my point is there still will be unicorns who can go out and be both a Swiss army knife, but have every blade sharp. Like there still will be some people who are in their personality and skill set able to do that. But I think for the large part, even with advancements in technology and the ability for more accessible tools to be consolidated under fewer people, there's still a lasting power in collaboration. There's still a really important element of what is this person's perspective because their lived experience is different than mine. That's kind of timeless. Like that's so critical to our process. Making a commercial and making a documentary, making a short film is a team sport. And it's not a team sport just because the gear is heavy and like physically you need multiple people to carry the gear. That's, that's part of why it is a team sport, but that could go away soon. Even if making a commercial is someday just like in made in like a bank of editors, I think it's still going to be a better product if there are multiple minds working on it together, as opposed to this is, this is a brainchild of one person exclusively. Again, there will be some wildly talented visionaries who can, grab these tools kind of by the horns and make it alone. And that's pretty cool. But I, th- those people are quite rare. And I, I think also even they could benefit from collaboration. I love your perspective. So, so let me ask you this. What do you think about the ethics of AI in the creative process? There are, there are lots of concerns that people have around whether using generative AI tools is ethical. Are you stealing from artists? How do you respond to somebody that says, I don't want to use these tools because I find that it's unethical. Well, 
It absolutely is plagiarism. And <laughs> if there's a price to pay for that plagiarism, perhaps there's a deal to make with the artist. Hmm. Yeah, we talked about this yesterday. We talked about the disruption in distribution as it happened with music and iTunes. Now we're starting to see that yes, in other yeah. forms as well. On, you know, Chris and I covered this in the news over the last several weeks. Companies like Google are approaching the content creators. They're going to Reddit. They're going yes. to uh, Automatic. And they're saying, you have the content. We'd much yes. rather have an above board relationship with you. Of course, there's the downstream problem that at some point, the incremental revenue or incremental uh, return on investment for the artist is, you know, so yeah. small that it's not worth doing. But then it also pushes them into other areas, which surprisingly are very real. Like, you know, we see more yes. artists heading towards live music and also owning their content. I think probably one of the best business people in the world right now. Taylor Swift. Is Taylor Swift. Um, so do we see that content model being disrupted in a good way or a bad way? Or is it a combination of those two things? Um, well, good and bad is so subjective. Right. <laughs> good. Good for who? <laughs> good for the creator. I say. Right. The creator. Yeah. Creator. We're all creators. Yeah. All three of us have had experience being makers and designers, and creators, and so maybe let's start there, and then we can switch to the other thing that we've all been with as business owners. We're all right. owners and entrepreneurs. We've all had to make hard trade-offs and decisions around what actually makes it to the public or to the audience that we're reaching out to and what ends up on the cutting floor. Yeah. I mean, the only, the only difference between plagiarism and licensing is consent, right? It's like, if, if the artist is consenting to a buyer to copy their work, then that's their choice. Um, but it, it's, you know, the same act of copying as plagiarism. And so, uh, yeah, I, I was thinking about this analogy, um, Richard, of when Napster and LimeWire were just like cleaning out record companies. And Steve Jobs came to the rescue. And if you read his Walter Isaacson biography, there's this incredible scene where all of the executives from the record labels are in a room sweating just desperate. And Steve Jobs just comes in and says, it's going to be 99 cents a song and you're going to sell it all through me. And that's how it's going to be for like the next decade and a half. <laughs> it's like, and they were so desperate that they said yes. Good. But what it meant was so much less money for the artist. And they just unfortunately didn't have much of a choice. And so that's what I wonder if, is coming for journalists, for example, when you have something like perplexity reaching around the paywall to scrape and collect incredibly valuable content and distribute it for a fraction of the price and perhaps without the journalist's consent, perhaps even without the editorial's consent. So now you have deals in the works between the New York Times and Perplexity. But I highly doubt that adding that middleman is going to be as good for the New York Times as just selling directly to their subscribers. So, you know, I, I think it's the existing business model will not be good for those journalists or those creators, for example, unless they adapt much in the way the musicians did to your point. So are those journalists leaning more on books or public speaking for revenue, for example? Are we going to see more and more journalists leaving the editorial house and instead going directly to market on their own? And they can control their deal with the AI distributor. They can say yes or no, I do or don't consent to participating in perplexity, or I do, but only if it's going to link back to me. And perplexity, to their credit, has actually done a pretty good job at that. So I might say, I've established myself well enough as a creator, content creator, or a journalist in this case, that I'm going to 
leave the New York Times or I'm going to leave the Journal or the Boston Globe because the deal that they've struck with Perplexity or any kind of other AI um, server is not serving me. And so I'm going to represent myself. I'll have my own deal with these giants, these AI distributor giants, and it will have its own kind of terms and conditions. I just don't know if there if if individual creators and journalists are going to have that kind of leverage i certainly hope so yeah one one perspective that's worth introducing here is uh uh naval ravikant has spoken about the trend towards individuals becoming sovereign in the sense that all of us right will eventually operate as 1099 creators because the model of the company has changed as well initially there was a factory model the commercialization of that factory model in all its different modalities has proven to be a terrible thing for most people in the sense that <laughs> while it provided scale, it also provided anonymity, right? It reduced the value of the individual creator mm. yeah. and to the opportunity to corrupt the system in the sense that individuals are no longer recognized, credited, or given or, or any kind of authority over the creations. Naval believes, and I'm starting to see this in, in my own work, is that companies will become smaller and smaller and will actually represent the brand, but not the individual. And the individual creator will participate with sovereignty. Chris and I have talked about this as uh, we see AI spreading around the world countries representing those levels of sovereignty are also saying, hey, this is our IP. You, you can't just globalize everything. So that's another layer of that conversation is that the creators aren't just being seen as individuals, but within the boundaries of the organizations or companies that represent those people as well. So I think we, we don't know yet. I think it's too early to say, but we're certainly starting to see the tooling be part of the sovereign conversation. Yes, and like sovereignty for a creator, true sovereignty for a creator is just somebody shouting into this into the sky. <laughs> no. What we're really talking about is YouTube, for example, replacing the the, the previous editorial that they were signed at. It's like mm -hmm. if the journalist is like, you know what, screw this. The deal I'm getting with the traditional media house isn't working for me. I'm going to go represent myself on what? On Instagram or YouTube or whatever that channel is. Right. And then you are then, again, just trading oh. one behemoth for another. Right. And, you know, consenting perhaps <laughs> uh, resentfully to a, a whole new set of terms and conditions. And so, yes, it's perhaps more direct. You don't have an editor combing through you. But this is the question of, is the bookstore responsible for the content in its books? And that's the question the New York Times has answered, certainly, by saying we absolutely fact check everything. We absolutely stand by everything. And I think YouTube is struggling with that, obviously. You know, there's issues of hate speech and, and everything else. But it's yeah, it it that's that's uncharted, um, and, and like you said, we'll see. <laughs> Fripp, I I do need to push back. I need to dive deeper. So AI is definitely plagiarism. Expand on that. What part of AI is plagiarism, and how do you rationalize using it if that's something that you believe? Well, AI AI is plagiarism in its first year, which is really the last twelve months. So majority of it being 2023 because it basically snuck up on creators in most ways without consent it said look at this amazing copycat tool that we have built on your creations and the creators were like who let you in <laughs> like, <laughs> like who who let who said that was okay and of course, yeah. the AI people had a point, which was like, okay, you are the ones who put all of it online. What did you think would happen? <laughs> yeah. You shared yeah. it with the world. It's not, like, it's not like I broke into your house. 
to see, you know, your collection of writing. We should go to your trash. <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, it's like, so I think, I, I think we are now just realizing, oh, got it. Okay, this is the balance of privacy versus security that we didn't realize we needed to strike. So many parents posting pictures of their kids on Instagram, really having no yet clear case study of understanding what the consequences of that could be, for example. Mm -hmm. Because we're human beings. We like to connect. We like to express. We like to share. We like to create. And that's our nature. And until we, you know, find out the hard way, what the consequences of that will be, we'll just keep expressing and creating. Um, and I do think, you know, the pendulum will swing and we'll find the balance. Um, but like I said, it's, it's an act of plagiarism because there's a lack of consent. So when we strike these deals between the creators and the distributors, the AI distributors, that act of copying will no longer be plagiarism. It will just be licensing. And then, and then maybe there's a path forward. I don't know where everybody wins, maybe not winning to the extent that the creators used to, but at least it's not nothing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and I just, I worry that the analogy of iTunes will fall short mm -hmm. because even then the musicians still had some leverage by saying there's a fixed number of talented musicians in the world. So they were still able to kind of control production to an extent mm -hmm. by just saying like to iTunes and you know, the middleman record labels, like, this is my worth because there's only so much supply of my talent. You have to spend years learning an instrument. You have to train your vocal cords in order to create this kind of content that is worth anything for you. That's where I'm a little bit worried that the history of iTunes might not be fully analogous. I'm a little bit cautious, again, optimistically, but cautious that having an idea is obviously much more accessible than learning how to play guitar. Yeah. Well, if we've learned anything, that is humans are absolutely terrible at predicting the future. Yeah, of course. Even though they have all this history. <laughs> right. And what we are going to continue to do here in these conversations is pick up that scab, find out just where it goes. So... We've got a few minutes left. Chris, do you have any other questions before we start wrapping this up? So back on the ethics point, because I think yeah. it's, a, it's a major sticking point for people that I, I think you being in the industry, you're really well positioned to have a perspective on that's super valuable. There's an argument that, hey, when you were learning film production, you had to watch other creators. You had to learn from them. It wasn't plagiarism for you. You were learning. What makes it plagiarism for an AI to learn from us, its creators, and then to go to, an, whether it's copying us or mimicking us, what's the difference? And at what point do you draw the line between that being plagiarism and it being a learning experience? Yeah. Well, I could imitate, but I actually couldn't legally copy. <laughs> and there's examples, you know, going back to like Andy Warhol, for example, getting a lawsuit from Campbell's Soup. <laughs> um, so, Best thing would have happened to them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Maybe that would have served my career if, if, I, if I imitated somebody else's work who was famous and, and they put their spotlight on me with a lawsuit. So, so I've certainly, like AI, have trained myself and other, other creators have trained themselves by reading and watching and listening and talking and learning. But I understand that there's still a line there, and I can't simply regurgitate mm. and imitate. There has to be some element of what I'm doing that is unique and original. I think in a very literal sense, like obviously everything that comes out of Midjourney isn't like a literal, it's not pixel for pixel, the same thing as what, you, what they were trained on, but it's damn close. And that's where I'm saying I'm not sure that it, that's where I'm saying there's definitely some content that's coming out of these yeah. AI tools that we have now that does fall on that legal within the legal definition of, of plagiarism. Okay. Thank you. And then my final question will be looking forward. What are you most excited about for the potential of AI within your domain, both in the short yeah. term and the long term? If you were to have like one magic wish to the genie of AI, what do you <laughs> want AI to solve for you? 
That's an interesting way of framing the question, Chris, because you're asking me what will AI solve? And I think in so many ways, AI is going to solve problems we don't really know that we have Mm. because they're just like the way of doing things that we've always done them. And we don't, we don't even view those processes as problems. We just view them as in some ways, like this is just the current solution that I have for this, but it will just be an entirely new solution. So, you know, what am I excited about? Um, Being originally a documentary filmmaker and steering at least part of my focus back to nonfiction. I'm, I'm pretty excited in the ways that AI will lower the barrier to tell true stories mm. for people around the world. And it's happening at a time that, this, that, that the same barriers are being lowered in other tools. So for example, you have it's like incredibly cinematic quality coming out of the new iPhone. It's like portrait mode for video mm-hmm. and it records records log footage that is like full raw media that you can do your own color grading on and record straight to a hard drive. And like I said, that depth of field, what people call portrait mode feels like I'm shooting this thing on a big heavy camera with a huge piece of glass on the front of it. I think when you put that kind of tool in the hands of people around the world, a documentary is no longer like the talking head plus historical footage thing that I saw when the substitute teacher like put the VHS tape in. (laughs) It's not, that's not a documentary anymore. A documentary is like, Oh, somebody was there at the time and they're a fly on the wall. It's what's called verite, which just is like this fancy French word for meaning the scene before us. It is unfolding in front of us. It's not like we're talking about it retroactively. It's like it's happening in front of our eyes. And in that way, like that's more competitive in terms of drawing eyeballs than a reenactment. So you have the crown, for example, what if the production quality of that Netflix show was actually like (laughs) at the time of it happening? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Do you know what I mean? It's like the lighting is great. The cinematography is amazing. The storytelling is good. The drama is there. But what if it was just like, Oh, everybody in the future royal family is just like filming each other with their phones. <laughs> right. I think there's something like that. I'm just trying to remember what it's right. called. Yeah. <laughs> and I, and I, maybe the crown's the wrong example, right? Cause you probably can't, they're probably banning on that in, in the, in the uh, Royal palace. But I guess my point is where there's war unfolding, where there's incredible stories of adversity and, and struggle and challenge. There's now also, incredible cameras <laughs> so mm-hmm. the issue is not production like the iphone has totally solved that or, or changed that the issue is editing now and that's where ai is going to again lower this barrier like mm-hmm. what are people going to do with all this footage that's sitting around on their tiny little cameras yeah you know, they don't have the time or the skill to edit that even if they had the skill i have the skill i don't have the time to go sifting through all this footage and for a lot of these passion projects it's like okay i gotta find the money to hire that the human editor, I will still need that editor, but I won't need them for ingesting the footage, syncing it with the audio, organizing it, labeling it, doing all the work of the assistant editor, transcribing interviews or or, Mm -hmm. or dialogue. That happens instantly. And so the editor, whether it's another person or it's just the person who shot it themselves, can just go in there and instantly start making creative decisions in minute one which is a which is a revolution for documentary filmmaking so i'm i'm seeing especially with the drama around hollywood these days and the very real challenges that unions are facing in representing writers and actors it's becoming more difficult and streamers are just not making money it's becoming really difficult to justify the cost of an extremely expensive drama like uh like the crown for example and so um, when you're looking at cost per minute, nonfiction becomes extremely competitive in terms of pitching that to a streamer or a distributor, especially when it has the same drama as a drama. <laughs> it, is, it is as dramatic as the drama because, again, it was shot at the time of, of the story unfolding in front of us. And so I think what we're going to see on you know, streaming platforms is hopefully a renaissance of documentary filmmaking because the cameras are 
suddenly incre- creating incredibly imagery and in everybody's pocket because editing is now with the help of AI as an assistant editor, it's just purely creative process still for a human being to do. Mm-hmm. And because from a cost perspective, it's so competitive to make um, for those distributors and those streamers. So I think we're going to see a renaissance in, in documentaries. And I know, Richard, you warned me against like regurgitating something that's on my LinkedIn profile. And halfway through, halfway through this, I realized, wait, didn't I just write about this? <laughs> <laughs> well, you didn't write about it for this audience. We're, we're, we have yeah. a complete audience. So yeah. yeah. And Trevor yeah. Weller at it. Where can people that want to find out more about your work find you? Can you just give us some social links so that um, we can distribute it to our audience? Um, I would ref- I would recommend people to Windy Films for the work that we do. So windyfilms.com and link to social from there. Awesome. But I would really I would even before that I would recommend people subscribe to House of Content. H of content on Instagram, which is a shop that's run by a dear friend, Aran Sheesh, who was formerly at the agency Arnold. Um, and he taught me the very little that I know about these AI tools, prepped us for our Fenway model. Um, and he, at least in the market in the Northeast up here, like in New England, um, is really the person to know he's really on the bleeding edge of uh, integrating ai into production for and and post as well so check out house of content excellent thank you brilliant trip thanks so much um i really appreciate your insights we thought we were going to be talking about ai tools we ended up talking about everything and ai tools including ethics um this isn't an easy topic to solve just because there isn't a solution for all of the things that need to happen yet, as you pointed out, there's more opportunity than anything else. So I much appreciate you raising that flag and saying, hey, let's just stay curious here. Yeah, I really appreciate you guys having me on. This is a pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Maybe we'll have you again in a year's time and your mind will have exploded. <laughs> <Yeah. already. laughs> I, I have no idea. That's the crazy part is I have no idea what the, what the future looks like. Yeah, we didn't even, we didn't even talk about Sora. We- yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think the last, the, 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 the point about Sora is, is fascinating. The, 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 the lasting thing about Sora is like garage band for musicians. I'm going back to this iTunes analogy. It's like the musicians still said like, sure, you can, you have all these instruments that you can assemble to get as, assembled together instantly, but like it still takes somebody who kind of knows what they're doing. Mm-hmm. And that's where the clients are still going to hire us because the clients don't necessarily know what they want. Yeah. And AI doesn't really know what they want either. So I think as long as we're defining our value, not by our ability to like build a camera and hit record or our ability to like link, link a project in Adobe, as long as we're defining our value as we understand how to tell stories, then we will kind of forever in my opinion, at least maybe not forever, at least in this generation, outpace AI. Love that. Good to hear it. Well, thanks again. Much appreciated. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you both. All right. Bye-bye. Take care.